And now we're recording. Welcome to this webinar presentation from the Center for the Ministry of Teaching at Virginia Theological Seminary. We call this presentation Wisdom from the Field, and it is our webinar series. It is being uh, sponsored and contributed to by Building Faith, which is uh, the website that we work on. And I'm going to go ahead and share the slideshow presentation so that you can watch along. This webinar is all about planning for Lent. And you're in the right place. I realize that uh, this link is not going to be an active link for you, uh, but this is the link to the slides. Um, you can get to them also by going to buildfaith.org and click on today's post. Um, and also in a day or two, since you're registered for this webinar, um, a, an update email will be sent to you that will have the recording of this whole webinar as well as a link to the slides. So you don't have to worry about writing down everything. Um, the slides will be available to you. Again, this is a Center for the Ministry of Teaching at Virginia Theological Seminary in conjunction with Building Faith. And I want to take a minute just to thank you for being with us and to say that this is all for a greater purpose. And we thank you for carving out the time in your week Whoever you are, wherever you may be listening, whatever you've been doing, you've come for this time, and I encourage you to be able to set aside whatever distractions you can and be present in this time. It is for a greater purpose, and if I can speak spiritually for a minute, to remind all of us and to remind each one of you, at this moment, you are loved and adored by the creator of the universe, you are made in the image of God, and you are precious in the sight of the Lord. And you have been redeemed through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You are filled with his spirit, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. So that you have a ministry, and you are a minister for the gospel, and we have the sacred opportunity to spread and share that good news with the people around us. So thank you for being here, and more importantly, thank you for the work and ministry that you are doing for the kingdom of God. In that vein, I want to share an opening prayer together. So let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, so draw our hearts to you so guide our minds, so fill our imaginations, so control our wills, that we may be wholly yours, utterly dedicated unto you. And then use us, we pray you, as you will, and always to your glory and the welfare of your people, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 I always like to do a scripture reading at the beginning of these webinars to ground us in the word of God. And then we're going to move right on to introducing our panelists and talking about planning for Lent. This is one of the scripture readings that will show up in the Revised Common Lectionary during the season of Lent this year. Um, in this lectionary year, we're going to hear a lot from the book of Romans uh, in the epistle. So here's just a few verses from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us.
Okay, Krista Lovell, can you wave and say hello, Krista? Welcome. Uh, Krista, as you can see, is in the Presbyterian Church of the USA, and she has served all kinds of conversation, congregations. Uh, she's now coming to us from Huntsville, Alabama. Um, Krista, anything uh, that you'd like to add? Just that I am semi-retired, which gives me all the time in the world to work in my wood shop, carving little wooden figures to use in telling God's story through manipulative so that's a really fun thing and I just have to note it's 76 degrees here in Huntsville Alabama today. <laughs> All right well, we'll, winter. <laughs> <laughs> we'll turn to Sue for whom it might be a few degrees lower. <laughs> um, Sue has been a Christian formation minister for over 30 years and she's coming to us from St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Duluth, Minnesota. Um, she is the holder of several degrees in um, the fields of pastoral studies, and she's um, has many years of experience as a formation minister. Um, Sue, can you say hello and tell us anything else? Hello, and it's a balmy 20 degrees above zero here in Minnesota. It was 20 below last week, so we feel pretty warm up here, and welcome to everyone. All right. The, uh, the first question that we want to address here, and you know, this, this whole webinar is going to be about planning for Lent. We're going to be talking about some practical things, things that you can do, implement in your congregation, we're going to be sharing. But also, the point of these webinars is to have some big picture thinking as well. And what I wanted to ask our panelists to start off with is this question, how do you meet the people of your congregation where they are? How do you meet them in Lent? Where are they spiritually? What's on their minds? What's on their hearts? And, um, and how does the church meet them? And then talking specifically about Lent, how can the church, how can ministry leaders encourage a fruitful Lent for children, youth, and adults? Um, Krista, you're going to start us off. Okay. Well, we have made it through Advent. We've celebrated Christmas and Epiphany. And now we are in that period to look ahead to what's next. And in a few short weeks, we will enter a long period of Lent. The season that we have an opportunity to set aside the ordinary in order to experience the extraordinary. It's a time to pray, prepare, and most importantly, pause from the everyday life. I have found that it's a little easier to celebrate Lent, I mean, to celebrate Advent in, the, in our congregations simply because there's a cute little baby and it's a season where there's wonderful songs that make you feel good. As we move into the period of Lent, we talk more about confession and repentance and preparation. It's a darker period. And so we need to meet people where they are. Some are ready to do that, some aren't. Some need a different kind of fasting period, a different kind of way of preparing to walk with Jesus that final walk to Jerusalem. I would agree, and I think the Lenten season gives us a little more time. It's not quite as rushed as the Advent season, it's longer. Christmas is a crazy time of year. Easter is an as crazy for households. So it gives us more time to do just what Krista was saying, to pause uh, and really take a look at uh, what people are searching for. I think um, it's a long season and some people are searching but don't know what they're searching for. So I think the church can really use the season of Lent to show them signs of God's presence in their lives and really connect faith to daily life. And we try to meet them where they're at. And for us, that's both physically when they're in the church building, but also a big part of our congregation, we meet them online through hybrid uh, formation through our website, because the reality is a lot of people only attend once a month. They're not weekly attenders in years gone past. So we really have to try and meet them both physically and online. Yeah, 
Um, Krista, what about um, you know sort of different different households that we have in Lent um, in the church rather? Um, folks who might be retired versus folks who might have young children in the home uh, versus singles versus couples. Um, ha- can you talk a little bit about the, the different sort of households that, that are part of your church and how Lent or seasons of the church year might be experienced a little bit differently? Sure. I currently serve in a church that is only 330 members, a rather small church in terms of churches, and mostly older adults with only a few families. We have to be very careful with the word family because very often we plan family events and the single person or just the young couple or the elderly person who is widow or widowers. They don't feel like they are a family. They feel like they're an outsider. So one of the things that I work very hard to do is phrase what we are offering, both in writing and online and in participation, as an event for the whole church, the family of God, to be more inclusive of all of those people and to offer them the opportunity to mold whatever they are doing into their lifestyle. They might have 10 minutes or they might have 30 minutes to spend with a daily devotional reading. So it's something that they can have in a bite-sized chunk or the opportunity there is to spend longer with it. Yeah. And um, I'm just going to make us bigger for a minute here. Um, Sue, can I ask you a question about communication? Uh, Because you do such good communication up front with um, households and families and singles. Um, What are some of the different ways that as Lent comes up, you're going to be getting the word out for what your church is doing in Lent and the offerings for different groups of folks? Sure. Um, We have uh, emails that are sent out. Um, We have Uh, three emails, but one that goes to all the households is a weekly Sunday afternoon Faith at Home, which gives not only the gospel reading for that Sunday morning, but also an activity that they can do Faith at Home, no matter if it's a single household or with young children or teens. So we start promoting in that email, you know, the season of Lent coming up and what are some things they can do in their home. Um, We have a, a pretty active website that is really a 24-7 storehouse for formation resources. And then uh, we use Pinterest and a YouTube channel and Facebook and Instagram, um, all of those social media outlets to uh, help promote our events. Yeah, really nice. We have to work hard to do the, the other end of that, the written end with the newsletters and the bulletins because I have a great deal of people that don't even have a computer in their home. They are depending on spoken word and written word. So we have to be careful to do all of those things. We have a Facebook page and a website page, but I have to offer it in a broad spectrum, recognizing all the generations that exist within the congregation. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about program here. Um, Krista, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Reverse Lent? Back in the season of Advent, we did a Reverse Advent program where I asked people to, instead of asking for presents, to think of what they could give. In the season of Lent, Presbyterians are not good at giving up things and fasting. (laughs) It's just not something that we're comfortable with. We've only really been a liturgical church and celebrated the seasons since about the early 80s because John Calvin was so against that kind of thing. So what I have proposed and put together for our families and our congregation this year is a reverse Lent, a different kind of fasting based on Isaiah 58 that says, what kind of fast day am I after? God is saying to the people, I don't want your fast and your uh, wailings without actions. It's putting our faith into action. And so what I have laid out is a six-week journey with Jesus that begins on Ash Wednesday. And rather than doing an everyday kind of thing, I've set it up in weeks. 
sometimes it's hard to get people to think about doing something for the whole season of Lent. That's 40 whole days. Yeah, 47. Or, <laughs> or it's just six weeks. Would you do it for six weeks? Well, that sounds a little shorter. So I've done a weekly study where that picks up, this is based on the Revised Common Lectionary. It offers an individual or a family or a small group or a Sunday school class the opportunity to read the scripture for that week to wonder together, what is this saying? What was it saying then? What is it saying now? And then an opportunity to act, to put their faith into action, both by offering a, a physical offering of money, but also then an offering of stuff. Lent is a time to clean out, to clean out our spiritual bad habits, as well as the hoarding that we all are guilty of, whether it's food or water bottles or medical supplies or clothing. This is, gives an opportunity I've connected for our congregation. Four of our, five of our mission agencies, our mission partners that are local, that we can give these items to so that we are reaching out to our community, not just thinking about ourselves during the season of Lent. And then finally, an opportunity to pray together for the week. It could be used every day for a week, could be used once a week. I try to write things that are flexible enough that people can then choose how they are going to do it. And on Ash Wednesday, that's when the choices are made. How are we going to observe this season of Lent? Yeah. Um, and the next slide I thought was cool because this shows the, um, the sort of the, one of the finished products, Krista. Yes, these are the items that will be collected. Food on the first week, hygiene kits for church world service. That's an ecumenical partner of many of our denominations. They are first on the scene when a tragedy happens, a physical tragedy. And then water bottles, medical kits for our local uh, free clinic, and then finally clothing. So I tried to get one thing on each step, mm -hmm. working for the steps toward the cross, because we are walking along with Jesus on his final journey to Jerusalem as part of this so it's really a devotional study, but it's also an action. It's more than just sitting and reading. It's an acting it out. In our church, all of these things will be collected throughout the season and then dedicated on Palm Sunday and distributed the week of Easter. Oh, beautiful. So, um, you know, even if somebody um, forgets to bring their toiletry kit, to the church on the second or third Sunday, they could bring the toiletry kit and the water on the fourth Sunday. It can exactly. um, sort of go along. This yeah. display will be set up in two places, our fellowship hall for us and in our narthex because we have two worship services that meet in different places. And so it will stay up. And just like I learned during our Advent season with reverse Advent, people will look at it the first week and go, oh yeah, I want to do that. And the second week, I really should get that. <laughs> by the third week, they'll say, oh, yes, I've got to do that. And then they'll get there by the fifth week. <laughs> well, it's good, good that we have six weeks. Um, yes. Sue, tell us a little bit about this, um, this in your context. And I'm going to put up a, a really neat slide of a, of a document that you shared, which I quite liked. Sure. And I, I think... Uh, that's a, a, such a beautiful idea, Krista. Um, we too try to get them to look at the big picture, you know, instead of just giving up chocolate or those traditional little Lenten practices, uh, we try and get people to think about their whole life and their whole spiritual life. You know, what habits do they engage in that aren't, aren't uh, helping them in their spiritual health? So could, you know, they fast from those and then instead of just giving up something, feast on something. So it's not really those, you know, traditional chocolates or desserts or giving up whatever. Um, it's really taking a whole look at the big picture of their life and spending those six weeks to kind of pause and see what in their life 
whether it's attitudes or opinions or how they speak to each other or how they care for each other, what are those types of things that they could let go of and, and die and then give new life to other things and feast on other things? So this is just uh, some ideas that, that people can uh, use for that. Yeah, beautiful. I love this. Uh, these uh, documents and the slideshow are going to be available. Um, and then I think we can also, if folks wish, um, we can make PDF documents available through Building Faith so that you don't have to go through the slideshow. All right. We always sort of uh, pause uh, at this point in the webinar to see if folks have questions or comments. And so the chat is open. We can, our panelists can see all your questions. Uh, so just type away a uh, question for Sue or a question for Krista, or even if you want to uh, say something like, oh, my church does that too, or my church did that and uh, it went well, or my church did that and um, it didn't work as well as we hoped. Let us, let us hear from you. And as Krista said, I think the main thing is just to provide a variety of options. You know, what appeals to one household of faith isn't going to appeal necessarily to another household of faith. So in all of the slides that you'll be seeing in the next couple minutes, you know, we don't want you to try and do all of these ideas, uh, but, you know, choose a few that would appeal to all the age groups and all the varieties of households that you have, whether they be singles or older adults or families with young children or teens. That's great. Um, Sue and Chris, we've got a couple of questions uh, uh, with sort of about intellectual property here. Um, can folks use your documents or would you rather that they take your documents and create a version of themselves, uh, their own version for their church? What What's best? I'm happy for them to use to use mine. You know, the the less work we have to uh, put on our fellow colleagues, the better. So I'll be happy to provide PDFs of all the documents. I am too. Yes, what educators do best is share. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> share. Um, and uh, so this this stuff's going to be available. Of course, folks, if you like, you can always put a little um, credit at the bottom of things that you share. Just you know, say special thanks to um, Sue Van Oss or special thanks to to Crystal of all that. That's always a nice thing to do. Um, okay, we've got some comments from folks saying that we did Lent in a bag. Uh, of course, Lent in a bag is a post that showed up on Building Faith about uh, four years ago, and um, I think for a while it was our top hit with like uh, over 100,000 hits or something. Um, and we get a sample of the Sunday afternoon email as a question. Yep. Uh, I'll post also, a sample of that. Sure. Uh, okay. Michelle from Pennsylvania says, I'm intrigued by your online communications as you've identified clearly that folks no longer attend church weekly. Thank you. Please post this list of fasting feasting on would like to use it with both new and old. Yeah, so Sue, tell us a little bit about that Sunday afternoon email. You do that all year? Do it all year round. Uh, take the Sunday gospel because, you know, not only for the people who are there, it's a good reminder of what the Sunday gospel was, but for all those who weren't, um, do a link to where they can get the Sunday gospel online and then just do a simple faith at home activity and I try to make it broad just like Krista does so it, it appeals to all households whatever ages um, a simple activity that they could do at home that ties in with the gospel um, and I'll be happy to share some samples of that but we've had a pretty good response to that and did some analytics and between noon and one is a good time to uh, send out that email so okay. That's great. Um, can I ask a favor? I don't want to close my window here. So any of our viewers who are online um, and know where the Lent in a Bag post on Building Faith is, um, if you can go ahead and find that link and put it in the, um, in the chat box. 
It's actually on the slide, Matthew, and, that I uh, have coming Courtney up. Courtney Dale, thank you so much. If I were Lisa Kimball, I would say, uh, Courtney Dale is gonna get a free copy of our latest book from the CMT. <laughs> um, thanks, folks. Okay, um, we're gonna do some more program here. That was, that was the slide I was supposed to have up while we were asking questions. Okay, so we did our questions. Uh, Nancy Gladich, great question about the chat box on the video. Uh, we'll find out. It, uh, it records it. Zoom kind of has a special recording function, and we'll, we'll see if the chat shows up. Should we head on to some of the program? Oh, great. There we go. <laughs> We're moving forward. Uh, moving forward program, and the first program announcement is that hot off the press, this mm, resource, which is called Five Marks of Love, uh, for a few years now, the Center for the Ministry of Teaching has been working with a group called SSJE, Society of St. John the Evangelist, which is a, a monastic group in Boston, Massachusetts. And they have put together this Lenten series. It's a, a study series that comes with a really beautiful work, workbook. So that is a, a plug for uh, this free resources, free to download, free to print. Um, if you want to buy printed copies, they just charge you essentially for the cost of the printing and the shipping. And you can find out all about that uh, through the website and also we'll be posting an ad about it on Building Faith on Friday. Programs and events for Lent. What are some tips for programs and events during Lent? what works, and uh, Sue and Krista, what will your congregation be doing this year? And we're gonna start with Sue, because uh, she's got a lot of ideas. Um, folks, I'm gonna move through these slides a little bit quickly as Sue is talking. Um, if you wanna hear more about a particular feature, you know, just pop, uh, pop the question in the chat. Right. And Sue, go ahead. Um, so I've listed, uh some, a lot of the slides are just some resources coming out. A Sanctified Art just started last year, and it's a collective of artists and ministers that have come together to do a lot of great visual and, um, and written resources. We use their Advent Bundle, and it was a great hit in our parish. So uh, I invite you to look. They have a quick promo video, but they have a devotional guide. Their video clips and films are wonderful, and Lenten prayers bulletin, clip art, lots of great things. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, the next one is Illustrated Children's Ministry, another fairly new uh, resource. Adam Cleveland designs uh, coloring sheets, and he's just released uh, the Stations of the Cross for Lent. So it's a great resource to look at, especially if you have uh, people that enjoy visual art and working with art. What we do a lot of times um, is for all the seasons, we have a festival that we have during coffee hour. And that's one of the tips that I would have is really to model the prayer practice or the activity that you'd like families to engage in at home to model that first at church. We found that if they practice it at church once, they're much more likely to engage in it at home versus just picking up a Lent to go box and bringing it home and it sits on the dining room table uh, and they might not get to it but if they actually have a chance to open it up and experience it and practice that prayer practice in the church first at church with other people they'll be more likely to engage in it so for Lent uh, we have stations set up for people of all ages and we really try and encourage our, our elders to come as well and to see demonstrations of the various Lenten practices they can do at home so last year we had the take-home boxes, and I have the link there. Um, the idea, um, Lent in a bag, is, was very popular last year. We decided to do little Chinese takeout boxes uh, with an object for each week of Lent that was inside and a booklet describing that. And the next couple of slides will show what the objects were uh, that were, it was all contained in this box, and then the booklet. And that's another tip is really try and have everything people need in one spot. So if you're having them do a prayer practice that involves 
six purple pipe cleaners and three rubber bands and six index cards, don't make them hunt for that at home because the chance that they're going to do that is pretty slim. Make sure you provide all the items for these various activities all in one spot for them. And, and so, then too, I just want to tag this and reiterate um, and, and ask you to reiterate what you said about actually like demonstrating the practice at church at the festival. Yeah, um, we, we didn't used to do that. We, people would just walk around and pick up the items. And then we found out through feedback and evaluate, evaluating that uh, people really wanted to see it done in action. They wanted to actually do it first, and then they were more comfortable doing it at home. So now we have people at the various stations, and they'd actually come up, they pick up the item, but then they actually see a demonstration of it or actually do a quick version of the prayer pack practice right then and there. I, and that's, really, that's so great. Yeah, I mean, I, I know I've been guilty of this in the Christian education world of, you know, kind of making something and sort of just sending it home and, you know, you're sort of sending it off into the ether and not knowing what's going to happen. Yeah. That's great. Um, folks, as you're looking at this, please know that there are uh, hundreds of, well, maybe not hundreds, but plenty of different ways of doing Lent in a bag or Lent in a box. And um, we've seen lots of great adaptations. So the version on building faith is one, uh, well, it's the first version. And then we've heard from folks that they said, oh, well, we did, uh, well, we put this in, or we put this in, or we did this. And uh, as long as you help people understand the symbolism behind each piece, we are going to move on. And that's from the book inside the box, right? Right. Yep. Then some other things, uh, one of the stations we've done, the youth really wanted to have a station. Uh, so they wanted to design reusable tote bags. And this really increased significantly the amount of food that we collect. We usually do that over Lent, but uh, the kids designed these tote bags, handed them out at the Lent festival, and then encouraged people each week to bring the bags with food and put them on the altar. So it was a great visual every week of Lent, we had these purple bags in front of the altar. Then after the service, the kids would quickly grab the bags, unload them into boxes, bring the bags down to coffee hour so people could take them home and bring them back the next week. And then the final week on Palm Sunday, the people could take the bags home with them. So that's just an idea. Um, other stations ideas, we actually used SSJE's words of Lent last year. So one of their words was work. So we did the 40 bags in 40 days, um, which is helping to people declutter their home, 40 areas. Uh, for the word play, we had pretzel making bags. And again, we put all the ingredients, except the water, everything they needed in a baggie that they could just take home and make pretzels at home with a recipe and a prayer. And for the love word, we had little boxes where they could collect items. So just to, a slide to show you, you know, we, we give, them, give them everything they need uh, to go home. A couple other ideas, you know, these are all, there's lots of ideas out there, but making hot cross buns, we've done the kits where we give them a take-home kit to make hot cross buns at home. Uh, fasting cube is another idea. And then Lenten calendars, there's lots of different versions from chains, as you see in the lower corner, uh, with acts of love on it. But a great one, Tracy Smith, who some of you might know, um, has a PDF of a Lenten calendar with a, a different action, either prayer, fasting, or almsgiving action for each day of Lent. And it's just something quickly that you don't have to design yourself. It's already out there. You just download it. You can include it in your newsletters or hand it out however you'd like. Um, and I'm a deal getter. So I contacted Tracy and she's willing to give a 50% discount until February 1st if you use this code. So oh, all right. that's, a idea. that's great. Um, speaking of getting deals, <laughs> um, uh, one idea where I wanted to pass along to get items for the various festivals, we do festivals for every season throughout the year, is a place called nair.org. It's a place that gets excess new items from companies like 3M and Target, and then they offer that, those items, in turn to nonprofits for just a small shipping fee. So, for example, the metal trees you see there, I actually got them last March when I saw them online, and we're going to use them this Lent, hand them out to households at our Lent festival, along with 40 little tags that will have a word on it, 
Uh, we're going to use the SSJE words of the five marks of love on the front, and then an action, either a prayer, fasting, or giving action. We're going to hang those on the tree, and they can take that home, put it on their table, and then as they take off the little tags and attempt to do the actions, um, the tree will blossom and we'll have little flowers then at the Easter festival that they can add to the tree. Uh, the purple jars we're going to hand out for people to put their money in for our Lenten mission project. Cool. And the Advent bears uh, we got last, um, for the Advent festival, we had an Advent angel idea. And these are all great things, but like the stuffed bear was like $6 retail and we were able to get it for 25 cents. So I encourage you just to check that out. That's great. Uh, okay, we did this one before, but I uh, wanted to show it again as a, an option for one of the things you can do to, to hand out. Uh, the Build Your Own Cross. Another idea from uh, Heather Johnson, uh, you can have, if you have woodworkers in your parish or actually middle school or high school kids, put these pieces together and then you hand it out and households put the cross together as they do a little prayer action. Just another idea. Uh, this idea is from Mindy, uh, who I think is on the webinar right now. Um, she had a prayer net and a, a basket of ribbons and colored yarn, and it's a visual way for people to share their prayers silently. So as they had a prayer intention for someone, they tied a ribbon on to the prayer net, and it grew throughout Lent. And then you can Google, there's lots of things online about resurrection gardens, uh, but we had all the supplies ready for a resurrection garden that they got at Lent and with a little bag of grass seeds that they weren't supposed to put on until Palm Sunday. So it was kind of a barren garden through Lent. Then they added the grass seed on Palm Sunday. And by Christmas, the grass had, had uh, grown. By, um, by Easter, it had grown. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Easter. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then tell us just in one second about Milk and Honey Cooking School, and then we'll get on to, um, to some of the Krista. You can just check out this book. Uh, it's a great alternative to having a Passover Seder meal. It's just learning the history of God's people from Genesis to Jesus through a meal. And our parishioners love to eat, and it was a great thing to do during lunch. So you can check out that book for more yes. information. Sue, thank you so much for sharing all these. And I just want to assure everyone, um, this is to be inspired, uh, not intimidated. When I first saw <laughs> yeah. all of these, I said, oh my gosh, you know, uh, we need to do more. Um, it's not about doing more. And, and Sue, I don't think you do all of these every single year. This is- Correct, absolutely correct. Different this options. This is a compilation. Together in different yeah. years. Yeah. Um, but if I can kind of paraphrase, whatever it is that folks do decide to do, the keys are um, being prepared, uh, giving folks everything that they're going to need, um, talking it up and demonstrating it, and then uh, encouraging households to uh, to do it at home. Yeah, and then also having some kind of um, church connection way to like bring it back into the congregation, um, which is a nice segue for for what Chris is going to talk about. I'm so excited to show these beautiful pictures of the um, of the intergenerational Lenten event that Krista has done at her church. Like I said, we use Lent as an opportunity to set aside the ordinary and be open to the extraordinary. And this is a prayer garden. Uh, you can call it a spirituality center, and some people get, get all uh, creepy about that. And so I just simply call it a prayer garden okay. or a garden of prayer. Uh -huh. And this changes from year to year depending on kind of where the Holy Spirit leads us. It is set up, we set aside one room in the church, and it could be a Sunday school classroom, and we leave, we set this up one time and leave it for the entire season of Lent. And people are invited to come and spend time in prayer from one to another station. They might spend the entire time in one station, or they might move from station to station. The only rules for the room, so to speak, are to move quietly, speak in quiet voices so that you are not disturbing someone else's prayer. So here are a variety of things that you'll find in the room. One station might be about the praying the Lord's Prayer. 
teaching and focusing on the Lord's Prayer during Lent is an old and ancient tradition. And I use books. I use a tracing cross that actually is in our children's worship bags that's right in the center of your screen where the child can simply trace around the outside of the cross as the prayer is being said. Pretty soon they are tracing that cross with their finger and learning that prayer without ever having been taught it by memorization. Another good way to teach the Lord's Prayer is with a bracelet, where each bead on the bracelet is a phrase or a sentence of the Lord's Prayer. In another station, we have labyrinths. A labyrinth is not a maze. A maze is designed to confuse and to trap. A labyrinth is designed to have one way of walking in and the same way walking back out. As we enter the labyrinth and start the path, whether it is the big one on the left that is a walking labyrinth or the smaller ones on the right that are finger labyrinths, as you start, you let go of everything that is bogging you down until you get to the middle and then you rest. You stop and rest with God. You turn and as you walk back out that very same path, you are walking out as a child of God ready to re-enter the world renewed and invigorated. So we always have a labyrinth in our prayer stations. I love putting up pictures, and these are the old teaching pictures that have been in our Sunday school classes for years. And I put up pictures of the last week of Jesus' life. And I invite people to just pause with one picture at a time, maybe just one picture for the whole morning, and study that picture and put themselves in the picture or imagine what one of the characters in that picture was thinking as a way of praying with art. Praying with the cross. These are, are my collection of crosses, but we have invited people who collect crosses of the church to bring their own crosses, and we set up a display, and then we always have something available nearby that children, youth, and adults can use to create their own cross. So if you look at that picture on the right and you'll see there are clay crosses, there are rope crosses, there are twig crosses, and the children have made these when they've come in during a Sunday school period, and they leave them in. This is not about a make and take craft activity. This is all about worshiping with the cross and spending time recognizing the power that the cross has for us as more than just an art object, but all of these crosses were created by someone who had a theology behind what they were trying to portray. So when our children make crosses, they aren't to hang on the refrigerator necessarily. They are the activity is the activity, not the finished product. It's not about what you make and what it looks like. It's about the process of making it. Then we have water. We always have a water station. This is for your water fountain enthusiasts. Uh, I always have greenery, and these are just fabrics that I pick up at the store, buy, and I buy three and four yards at a time, and they're just draped over anything I can find to create a backdrop, so that when you're kneeling in front of this, you're not distracted by other things. You're listening to the water in the room. I have water beads, those glass beads that are down there. I have those for you to hold. I have towels for you to sit and feel the roughness of the towel as you remember Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. Stones are also in this. There are always instructions that give brief kind of guidelines on what you can do, but then the opportunity there is to spend time with this station and make it yours. 
Another one is praying with the senses. And these pictures are not real great, and I apologize for that. On the right-hand side of your screen, we brought in a bread machine. And I always time it so that the bread is finished as people are arriving. Oh, cool. And there is no better smell than fresh bread to draw you in. So you can come, and this is not a communion station. This is a taste and see that the Lord is good station. And yes, there is grape juice, and yes, there is bread, but there's also the spices there that an opportunity to make a little sachet that you can tug on and, f and smell those smells. On the left, those spices are more of the floral spices, and they bring about the sensation of remembering when the Mary anointed Jesus' feet with the precious oil and the smell filled the whole room. Again, it is praying with everything we've got, not just our lips, not just our minds, but with our senses as well. We offered a very simple thing several years ago, a wooden cross that came from a local craft store that cost all of $1.99. And we splurged and begged the, the uh, manager of the store to give them to us at a discount because I too, Sue, am always out for the deal. <laughs> and we just simply cut 40 ribbons, 40 purple ribbons and then six white ribbons and we invited families to tie a ribbon to their cross each day as they said a prayer for the day as they experienced Jesus. I made a little booklet called Beneath the Cross that had a simple prayer and a simple scripture for each day. I had families that wanted a 10 minute on the way to school thing. They wanted to have their kids sitting there eating breakfast, this sitting on the table, and this is all the time I can give it. So this was a no guilt kind of thing. Right. The other thing that we've done is we take simple wooden crosses and get votive candles or those little tea light candles. And just like an Advent wreath that has the candles that you light on the way to Advent, the Lenten cross has six purple candles and one white candle in the middle. And in reverse, you light all of the candles at the beginning of Lent and each week you extinguish one yeah, cool. until the only one that's left is the Christ candle for the resurrection on Easter. Oh, that is very cool. Then these are my little figures. I always believe that praying with the story is putting yourself in God's story and allowing God to be in your story. And so these are the little wood figures that I make that I've been using for ages and ages and ages that are part of a children's worship program, but I also put them in my lit stations because these are the stories of the season of Lent and Holy Week. And they go through to the Jesus appearance after his resurrection as well. Because when you pick up that Jesus figure and you spend time with Jesus and I, they don't have faces on them, they don't have any markings on them because it's all up to your imagination. So it's a simple way and a very tactile way. I'm a touch feel person and it's a very simple way of putting yourself in God's story. All right, um, Krista, thank you so much. Uh, such a, a wealth of ideas and um, so much like you, I'm glad you closed with that so much of the physical touch and the sensory aspect of spirituality. Um, that really speaks. Okay, we just have a few more minutes and then we want to have a little bit of time for questions. Um, but I want to hear from both of you because you are such uh, experienced Christian educators working in churches, um, not just the product, not just the program, but the process. Um, Sue, and I know you've talked a little bit about this, but again, in summary, how do you introduce, encourage, and then evaluate your program or event choices for Lent? Well, one of the things that we've found out is, especially with evaluation, to try and gather people together once a month to have a Christian formation board or whatever just doesn't really work. People aren't, aren't, don't have the time to do that. So I have an online advisory group. I, at the beginning of the year, I ask all the households. Everyone's invited to do it. 
Um, not everyone wants to do it. So I end up with maybe about 30 to 50 uh, emails. And once a month, I send out uh, once, just once a month, an email with three things that I'm asking, a planning question, an evaluation question, and then an advice question. So, uh, and ask them to send me the feedback. And that's really a way that I can see, you know, what has, what was the best thing about the Lent festival? Um, you know, that might be the evaluation question. Tell me what's the one thing you use the most in your household? Um, so that's one way that I really am able to get the input of a large number of people, but on their time frame. Yeah. And you have a, a set of folks that you usually send that email to? Yep. Um, I ask, you know, all the households if they want to get that monthly email and the ones that do, uh, I send it out on the first of every month and they know to expect it. And I give them about a week to reply back to me. Don't have them reply all because no one wants to get 50 responses. Uh, they just reply back to me and it's a great way that I get feedback. All right, and Sue, the three questions again? Uh, a planning question, an advice question, and an evaluation question. Yeah. So a planning one might be, you know, how many stations should we have at our upcoming, quest at our upcoming festival? Um, an advice question might is a kind of a bigger picture. I'd like their advice on, you know, should we change the time of formation sessions? And then an evaluation question on a previous event that's just happened. Yeah. And if folks don't have an opinion on those three things, they maybe don't reply to the email. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, all right. Um, Chris, I'm going to throw this question to you. Um, how do you get families to actually use the tools you provide? especially for families who are new to doing church? You can provide it, but you can't make them use it. <laughs> like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. <laughs> well, I too model things. I think what we use, we have an 830 interactive service. I put things in the middle of the table that we use yeah, nice. and they fall in love with it and or they don't. But then they're willing to take it home. It's like Sue said, if they practice with it at church, they are more likely to use it at home. When it's a pick up and take, weeks later they find it under the bags that they brought from everything else or it got pushed behind something else. We do constantly on, on our Facebook page remind people Hey, we're counting down right now. For instance, our Facebook page is full of counting down to Super Bowl Sunday and our canathon that we are doing. And I tell them how many more weeks we have. So that's a way of gentle encouragement and nudging without the guilt of, oh, gee, we didn't do this. Yeah. I've learned to, to make things easy enough to use and to learn your congregation. The biggest advice that I have for, for making it about the process is to not try to chew the entire elephant on the very first season of Lent. Pick one, give it a try, see how it works. What do we need to tweak? But knowing your congregation and knowing the people that you're designing for, what I love the best is custom writing. I've written curriculum for our denomination, but I'd much rather write it for my own church because I know who the user is going to be. So sit with a group of people. I do my evaluation time as a much more informal process. We Presbyterians in our church right now eat a lot. Okay. <laughs> every Wednesday night, every one Monday a month, one Sunday a month, every uh, <laughs> other month for this and that. I sit with people and just chat. And that's when I learn what's working and what's not. And that's when I go back to the drawing board and say, okay, let me rethink this. That didn't quite work as well. And then again, longevity. That reverse Advent cross will go up on the first Sunday in, in Lent. And I will plant things there myself as the thought process because some people are very visual. They need to see it every day when they walk past it. We um, thank you, Krista. Um, we've got a few more questions that have popped up, um, but Krista, those were all huge, I think, helpful points. 
Um, the question for Sue, what do you use in your evaluation process? Just an email, survey monkey, something else? I understand it was just email, right? Right. Um, we have a large evaluation once a year that we use SurveyMonkey for, but other than that, uh, it's just an email. Um, okay. And then a question that popped up uh, to the panelists and then Sue answered it. Um, it was, hey, do you do online videos of like uh, introducing Lent in a box or Lent in a bag? I never even thought of that, but Sue, hybrid faith formation expert that she is, already thought of that. And she said, yeah, I'll, I'll do a, you said you do like a video on YouTube of you uh, showing the Lenten activity. Yep, uh, we've just started doing that. I, I think it's a great idea. Um, and more and more, you know, I think that's the way to go. That's brilliant. And you know what's cool too is it's, it's you in the video, right? Yeah. So, cause I know a lot of times we'll share videos through our, you know, email newsletters, but it'd be like somebody else doing an activity. And it's special if it's your pastor or your Christian formation person doing the video. Well, and a lot of times I'll try and have families do it. I, someone just said, can we link to your videos? I don't particularly like being on video, so. Um, oh, but it'll I, I be like a family from your church. Right. I might oh, be in cool. the background, but I usually have like a kid or a family. Good thinking. Um, great question. I have a really hard time getting feedback from people just from the most vocal people. Um, it's hard to know what the group as a whole thinks. Um, so you want to tackle that? I'm sorry, what was that one? Um, well, I'll go to Krista first and then Sue jump in on this. Okay. Uh, I have a hard time getting feedback from people. I usually just get feedback from the most vocal people. Um, it's hard to know what the whole group uh, is thinking. Any ideas for that? I've always found, I, I hear what you're saying on that. I've always found that I go to them. I just ask them. Because the vocal ones will come to you. You yeah, don't have to ask them. Yeah, no problem there. <laughs> Especially the vocal ones who don't approve of what you're doing. Right. The, the uh, criticism is quick to come. Yeah, right. Compliments are, are a little slower to come. So this year when we start painting our Lent, Lenten mural that we're going to paint during worship, uh, I'll just stand around and talk to people while we're painting. Yeah. If you do it in an informal way, usually they will open up. And, but you can't, I've never found that sending out the, the wide swath of get your opinion, you get a small percentage back. But if you talk one-on-one -on -one to people, and I know it takes time. And in our age of computer technology, we are losing the touch of personal relationships, but I think it's important. If you want to know where people are, ask them. And I think another helpful thing is, you know, when they do reply back to you and give you feedback, like in our monthly email, I make sure I respond back to them and say, and comment on something they gave feedback on. So they realize that I'm actually listening to it and paying attention yes. to it. You know, yeah. thank you so much for that idea. Uh, we'll try and use that next year, or whatever the case may be. I, I reply back to them and try and build on that relationship. Um, yeah. Friends, we are at the end of our time together. Um, Sue, thank you so much. Krista, thank you so much. Thank you for your ministry that you're doing and for your wisdom that you're sharing. Um, to all of you, thank you so much. Um, we always close with some final lines. Uh, it's not a prayer. It's always from a poem or a song. And uh, this time, it's from one of my favorite uh, gospel hymns, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. So let me read this and then sign off and say goodbye. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long. As I walk, let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord. Let it be. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. Thank you.